September 1941, New York. The largest steam locomotive ever built rolls off the assembly line, and a month later it is gone, shipped west across the country. Here's the thing, though. That machine never came back. 84 years and counting, the big boy stayed trapped in the American West, while its birthplace sat a few hundred miles to the east the whole time. America built a locomotive so massive that its own railroad network could not physically handle it anywhere except one mountain route in Wyoming and Utah. It was born in New York. It worked in the Rockies. It rusted in a California museum for six decades, and all because nobody thought to check whether the thing would actually fit on the rest of the country's rails. This is what happens when you build something too perfect. So Union Pacific had this headache with the Wasatch Mountains in Utah. The grade between Ogden and Green River ran about 1.14%, which sounds like nothing until you realize that pulling 3,600 tons up that slope meant double-heading locomotives, adding helper engines front and back, and slowing everything down. Every single climb up that mountain cost extra fuel, extra crew, extra time. The railroad wanted one locomotive that could haul the whole load alone, no assistance, and the same speed as the flat stretches through Nebraska. Otto Jabelman and his engineering team came back with a design in three months flat. American Locomotive Company in Schenectady landed the contract for 20 units at roughly $265,000 each. What rolled out of that factory was unlike anything the world had ever seen, and that was exactly the problem. The big boy stretched about 132 feet with the tender attached, weighed more than a fully loaded Boeing 747, and ran on 16 driving wheels split between two engine units that could pivot independently under one massive shared boiler. The industry called it simple articulated, which meant the front engine section could swing through curves that would have thrown any rigid locomotive of this size straight off the tracks. Tractive effort sat around 135,000 pounds at startup, and it was engineered for high-speed stability, even though real-world service rarely pushed it that far. The firebox burned through 28 tons of coal on a run. The tender carried about 24,000 gallons of water. During dynamometer testing in 1943, one of these machines pulled more than 60 loaded freight cars across the Wasatch Pass and generated over 5,000 horsepower at the draw bar. Union Pacific liked what they saw and ordered five more, bringing the fleet to 25 locomotives total. And that's when the real issue became clear. See, a 132-foot locomotive needs a turntable of at least 135 feet to physically turn it around. You cannot just run the thing backwards forever. At some point, you need to rotate it and point it the other direction. How many turntables that size existed across Union Pacific's entire network? Only a small number, concentrated almost entirely along the Wasatch route. Cheyenne, Laramie, Green River, Ogden. The turntable at North Platte, Nebraska was too short, so big boys rarely showed up there and only under special circumstances. Here is the real killer. Union Pacific's track ended at Chicago. Everything east of that belonged to different railroads, New York Central, Pennsylvania Railroad, and Baltimore and Ohio, each with their own smaller turntables, tighter curves, and different clearance standards. Nobody had ever bothered checking whether a big boy could physically operate on eastern trackage because Union Pacific had no reason to send one there. The locomotive was engineered for one specific mountain crossing and accidentally became a prisoner of the very specifications that made it exceptional. And this is where it gets painful to think about. The big boy was born on the East Coast, in Schenectady in the state of New York, nearly 2,000 miles from where it would spend its entire working career. But the machine could not even leave the factory under its own steam. Number 4000, the very first big boy completed, was loaded onto reinforced flat cars and hauled dead across half the continent. A railroad term meaning it was unpowered and carried like cargo. It traveled west over multiple connecting railroads until it reached Omaha, where a small switching locomotive pulled it across the Missouri River Bridge. The boiler was fired up for the first time in early September 1941. 
The most powerful locomotive ever constructed entered the world as a helpless package being towed by machines a fraction of its size. From that moment forward, it would never see its birthplace again. The big boys ran the Wasatch grade for two solid decades and performed exactly as designed. Impossible loads, impossible terrain, impossible schedules. They handled all of it without complaint. Then diesel technology matured, and the fleet got retired one by one. The last revenue run happened in July 1959. Number 4014 logged out in December 1961 with 1,031,205 miles and it was donated to a railroad museum in Pomona, California. It sat there for 50 years while volunteers kept the paint fresh and the rust at bay. The California climate was gentle, but nobody seriously believed the locomotive would ever operate again. Restoring a big boy would cost millions, take years, and require expertise that had mostly disappeared with the steam era. In 2012, Union Pacific announced they wanted a working big boy for the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad. They inspected all eight surviving big boys, scattered across museum collections in seven states, and chose number 4014 because the Pomona locomotive still had one of the best preserved boilers. Five years of restoration work followed at the Cheyenne Steam Shop, with a complete teardown, a new firebox, conversion from coal to oil firing, and installation of modern positive train control systems. The bill ran somewhere north of $4 million. In May 2019, number 4014 moved under its own power for the first time since the Eisenhower administration, and it toured across the West and Midwest, pulling crowds of thousands at every whistle stop. But Chicago remained the invisible barrier, and the infrastructure limitations that had trapped the big boys since 1941 still existed in 2019. That may finally change in the mid-2020s. Union Pacific has announced plans for a major national big boy tour tied to America's 250th anniversary, made possible by partnerships with Eastern railroads such as Norfolk Southern, which controls former Delaware and Hudson trackage leading towards Schenectady. The same corridor that once carried a big boy west as dead freight could for the first time see one return under its own power. The Aloco factory itself is long gone, demolished and redeveloped years ago, but the rails are still there. America built 25 of the largest locomotives in history and then realized the only place they could actually operate was one mountain corridor in Wyoming and Utah. They worked that route for 20 years, sat in museums for 60 more, and only now, as railroad networks finally interconnect again, might one of them reach the city where it was assembled? The big boy was never a failure. It did everything it was supposed to do. The problem was that the engineers optimized so perfectly for one task that the machine became unusable everywhere else. They solved the mountain problem and accidentally created a geography problem. Somewhere in Schenectady, on ground that once built the mightiest machines in the world and now holds warehouses and parking lots, a steam whistle may soon sound again for the first time in generations.